Hey guys, it's Edbert. So today, I wanted to talk to you about the difference between a bad, good, and great engineer. As you begin your careers, you're going to be inundated with advice from random people you never asked advice from. That you need to know five different languages, that you need to pump out more code than the next guy, and put in a lot more hours in order to get ahead in your career. While there's a kernel of truth to all of these, almost all of them actually miss the whole point. What it means to be a good engineer. And so what I'm going to do for you today is describe three dimensions that you can use to judge someone if they are a bad, good, or great engineer. I'll try to keep this irrespective of level. It doesn't matter if the person is a junior, mid-level, or senior engineer. What you might find interesting is that coding itself actually is one of the least important factors. And I'll discuss why. By no means is this list exhaustive, but I'll try to give you a surface level understanding of what it takes to be a great engineer. So if you like this video, please like and subscribe and watch this until the very end. It lets me know that you like videos like this and you want to see more of them. And if you follow me on my socials, you can vote for what topic I cover next. So with that, let's begin. So I can tell you that there are a few key understandings in skill, depth, and efficiency that sets the best apart from the rest. And so you can think of this as a follow-up to my previous video on how to get promoted and what weaknesses exist for engineers of various levels. I'll link the video right here. And I'm not just someone who talks to and studies other engineers. I have put these into practice myself. I'll be drawing on my eight years of coding experience, four of which were professional, spanning two continents, several startups, Apple, Uber, and a variety of my own clients. I've been on both sides of the table as a project lead and as a follower. So I'd like to think I have some understanding of which habits and traits make engineers competent and which ones are indicative of a lack of skill for a lack of better term. So let's start with a very basic definition of what is an engineer. An engineer is someone who designs, builds, and maintains something which, in our cases, is a product written with code. Therefore, when comparing engineers, we can consider the better engineer to be faster and more efficient at designing, building, and maintaining a product, whatever it might be. Now the trade-off for doing this is time and money. After all, a person has to be paid to write a product, and it takes time for him to both write and maintain the code. You know the old saying, time is money. At a small scale like a demo product, the speed at which you churn out code is the primary factor. But as you scale up, money and time become the primary factor, with most of the money going to paying developers and scaling up infrastructure. At large scale like big tech companies, the time to make and maintain the product becomes the most critical issue because oftentimes, dozens of developers will be working on it. If you can save every engineer on a project just one hour in a 100-man team, then you have just effectively saved 100 developer hours, which, at the going rate of engineers, is approximately $250,000 to $300,000. On the other hand, if you make a mistake that costs an hour, then you will cost the company that same amount as well. And the larger your project, the more that becomes the factor. The trivial becomes the important and vice versa. So how does that tie back into a bad, good, and great engineer? Let's start with how an engineer writes code with all this in consideration. A bad engineer will focus on how fast they can churn out code and puts an emphasis on the language. Throwing code at a problem is the least efficient and arguably the most expensive per unit of time. Trying to throw random snippets at a problem in four different languages can eventually solve it, yes. And maybe the problem is small and inconsequential enough that just spending one hour writing a hacky script to get rid of it is probably fine. Now, what happens when your shoddily written script needs to be maintained and grow into a bigger product? Now what? You're probably going to have to rewrite it again to be cleaner and better so that other people can actually read and modify it. Then you've put in effectively three times the amount of effort to do the same amount of work had you just written it properly to begin with. A good engineer will be aware of this and try to abstract and design the code before they write it. But they will not design for the future, but rather for irrelevant contexts like maybe best practices or something like that. And you'll often hear developers give the reason that something is best practices for the reason why they've written something in a particular way. But the reality is that best practices are industry standard recommendations that are designed to help developers solve problems in a clean and well thought out way that is for general use case. In fact, the best designs you'll see very often are the ones that can give you the most options after committing to them. And a lot of the best practices do give you that. But just because something is industry standard doesn't mean it's right for you or your problem. In fact, 
over abstraction is the enemy of good code since it just forces you to maintain a shit ton of interfaces that are never used for any future use cases and may never reasonably come. Nevertheless, a good engineer will at least be thinking in that direction, but they will not properly contextualize it. A great engineer will write code to solve the problems of today, tomorrow, and the indefinite future. The best kind of work is to do no work at all. Imagine a piece of code that requires zero maintenance and whenever you want to make a change, the code just magically transforms itself to handle it. Well, you know, we don't exactly have that in the real world every single time. You might see some magic pieces of code that are phenomenal at handling this, but for the most part, these are very rare. So the next best thing is to have code so easy to understand and small enough that anyone can maintain it with only a few edits as the code and business cases evolve. But the code should naturally align itself in the right direction, so that way it's very easy to modify in order to satisfy the new requirements without becoming a jumbled mess of spaghetti code. And this is the misconception I think a lot of you have. A lot of you think that a code that's able to handle a lot of business use cases just ends up being 500 if statements. But the opposite is actually true. A great engineer, in this case, may actually negotiate to reduce the amount of cases in exchange for simpler, more maintainable code. If you can cut out the code written by 50 or 70% by taking out one simple non-critical requirement, then it's absolutely efficient and you should do this. So if you want to be a better engineer at coding, you need to pick the right targets and plan for the future instead of just trying to pump out more code. The next dimension of good engineers is the ability to delegate work and task assignments to others. And I think this is one that people really get wrong. The point of delegation is to get the job done as efficiently as possible by giving the task to the person who is the most suited for it. But there are a lot of nuances. A bad engineer will delegate work and knowledge because they believe it's that person's job to do it or know it. Their delegation style is to get things done the fastest by throwing more people at the problem. As a result, they often serve more as a glorified Google search for their company. Their motto is, it's not my job, it should go to someone else. A good engineer will understand that people have roles and are better suited for certain tasks. They will use people's strengths to efficiently get the job done and delegate the tasks to the people who are most suited for them. And they'll take the time to trim these tasks down into its core parts, so that way they can more easily be dealt with. This means clearing out any low-hanging fruit that might be small, insignificant, and easily dealt with. Their motto is, you're better at this part than I am. Can you take this up? I'll handle the rest. A great engineer will have the capacity to do any team member's work, albeit slower, but can quickly replace them given enough time and bandwidth. They are fully capable of taking over anyone's job, but choose not to because they understand that there is only so much time in the day that can be used efficiently elsewhere. They delegate not just for a person's strengths and efficiency, but also for their weaknesses as well. And while this sounds like the good engineer criteria, the fact of the matter is that a great engineer will consider both the strengths and weaknesses, while the good engineer will only consider the strengths. In other words, the great engineer motto is let me know what I can do to help unblock you. At first glance, you might think the difference between all three of these levels comes down to how much knowledge a person has about various platforms. That the best engineers know how to program in Android, iOS, and maybe Golang so that they can write mobile apps and backend code. But that's actually far from the case. No one writes efficiently in three languages or understands three different code bases at the same time, especially when these code bases change extraordinarily fast. Heck, it takes people three months to even get fully comfortable with a single code base, and even then, they barely operate at a level where they can submit clean code. But this is more of a matter of being able to handle things when people are unable to complete the work or fall short. This happens all the time, and this is the reason why you need to consider both the strengths and the weaknesses of the people involved. So let me give you a real life example. Joseph decides one day that a portion of the iOS code base should be removed. Joseph recently moved from iOS development to backend, but believes that this portion should be removed since it is best practice to remove dead code. So he assigns the task to the new oncoming iOS developer, Sam. Joseph believes that this exercise is a great way to get Sam familiar with how the code base works. Three months later, it turns out that a key feature was removed with the dead code but the code base had changed so much that doing a git revert was just not sufficient. So the team works around the clock to restore the dead code and reintegrate it. Sam eventually gets blamed for the whole instance, gets pipped and leaves. Now you might be thinking that this is just a case of politics and Sam got blamed because Joseph is a snake, but you're half correct. Much like a post-mortem, we'd like to figure out how to avoid this situation entirely. If we think about it, Joseph is a bad engineer for assigning tasks based simply on job title and role, not competency. Yes, Sam is an iOS developer, and iOS should be his strength, 
but this is a new code base, so this is his weakness, the unknown. Sam does not know what he does not know. If Joseph was a good engineer, he might have considered that Sam is new, he doesn't know a lot of the implicit assumptions or information in the code base, and Sam might not even ask the right questions. As a result, Joseph, as the good engineer, should do some due diligence ahead of the work. Realizing that the cleanup is not as simple and contains key features and dangers, Joseph would elect to do it himself as the risk may be too high and the task needs to be handled by trusted and experienced hands. But if Joseph was a great engineer, he would tell Sam to watch out for these key features and pitfalls. He might even act as Sam's check on his work. In this way, Joseph is responsible for Sam's onboarding and understands that Sam's weakness is his lack of knowledge. By giving him the knowledge ahead of time, Sam's weakness is lessened and less of an issue. In this way, you avoid the whole political situation to begin with. Both these engineers accomplish something. Sam gets onboarded with actual experience and Joseph can work on other more important things and claim credit for a good idea. It's just a plain win-win. So you can begin to see how incorrectly giving work to the wrong people or not setting people up for success can actually cause major headaches on a company wide scale. Very often, it's not the assignee's fault. It's just the case of the assigner or delegator not understanding what makes a person suited for a task and what is not. Which leads us to the third dimension, depth of understanding. Now every engineer understands how to write code at least to some degree, and maybe enough about their own tech stack to code comfortably in it. But how much understanding of it should they have? A bad engineer will only understand how to write a product. They only understand their own tooling, language, and code just enough to finish a task and maybe maintain it for a while and move on. They tend to over rely on copying code from Stack Overflow to get the job done without understanding its limitations and risks. They're the kind of people to spam reset commands when something breaks. In my eyes, most people in the industry fall into this category and it's one of my major pet peeves. Usually, you expect a person who has worked with a language or platform for five years to actually understand the nuances of it, how to get around certain issues, and begin to develop an understanding of how things work under the hood. But in reality, very few people actually do this. This is why people confuse years of experience with job competency. If you spend years with bad engineering habits, don't be surprised if you end up being a bad engineer. Not understanding how things work or why things work is the best way to stay bad at something. A good engineer will understand how their tooling works. They understand what the tools can do and what they cannot do and plan around that. They will understand that the code will have limitations and that their design choices will have future impact. However, they do not contextualize the problem, but instead just memorize different ways of doing things. These engineers tend to progress slowly, but are relatively competent over the long term. You can ask them to explain something to you, and they'll probably do a good job of doing it and draw on past experiences to justify them. Where they fall short is that they won't be able to explain to you why some trade-offs are better than others. They lack the ability to tie this to new contexts that may appear in the future. A great engineer will understand how their tooling and code will interact and try to understand why things are the way they are and how to make them better. They will go down the rabbit hole and understand the details of how things are built and what the implications are. They will understand how a code base got to where it is today and at how it drives where it will be tomorrow, even if these things are not a direct description of their job. If it touches their work in a frequent or significant way, these types of engineers will actually seek to understand it. This is why you see that platform and DevOps engineers at companies are very often at least senior level engineers or at least a very high mid-level. These types of engineers are working on tooling and code that is used by hundreds if not thousands of engineers. And any little move they make will have a big impact. Being meticulous about your understanding and care is very paramount so that the time is not wasted on mistakes or errors. This is opposed to most people who think that things can always be solved by coming together. I know this sounds pretty nebulous, so let me give you an example of this. Dependency management. Suppose module A needs classes from module B and module C. A bad engineer will make module A depend on module B and module C, push the code, and call it a day. A good engineer will be aware of the danger that maybe classes in module C will depend on module A. So there will be a circular dependency that will make modules just depend on one another. This can create a lot of problems, one of which is dependency hell, where a change in module A triggers a change in module B, which triggers a change in module C, which triggers a change in module A, and so on and so forth. At which point, this just creates a huge monolith that is not easy to untangle, eliminating the whole point of modules. Therefore, a good engineer might actually do some dependency inversions and move classes to their own modules to avoid this problem. A great engineer will understand that this is a systemic problem that can happen anywhere, not just his own project. 
So he'll write a script to automate this process, either as a linter to prevent code from being pushed if it creates a circular dependency, or create a tool that will automatically invert the dependencies for people and adjust the class definitions for them in order to avoid the circular dependency problem. As you can see, as you become a more competent engineer, you will understand how the process affects not just your code, but the entire code base. You'll also know how to deal with them in a way that creates wide impact and benefits a lot of people that you have never met. Sure, the good engineer will be aware of the problem, but a great engineer will fix them if the problem is big enough and knows that this problem is very reasonable, can happen to anyone, and is independent of any programming language you might be writing in. It requires an understanding of how code and people interact and knowing where the pitfalls lie. So believe it or not, to become a great engineer, you do not need to know a shit ton of math or a shit ton of programming languages. It just requires you to actually think about how code and people interact with each other. This is why in order to become a great engineer, you need to have a natural curiosity and deep desire for deep understanding. It's just that the better engineer you are, the more you're thinking about design and how to make the entire process of building code faster and more easily maintained for the lowest amount of cost, especially when that cost is time and money. So if you see someone giving advice, ask yourself, what viewpoint are they coming from and why do they suggest this advice? Heck, maybe one day I'll review some bad coding or programming advice if you guys want. Let me know. So that'll do for me. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Also, feel free to connect with me on my socials where you can vote for what topic I cover next. And if you want to try and secure the next job offer, you can book me for interview coaching at eChanTech.com. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and I'll see you all in the next one.